Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Robert Winter, and welcome to another lesson with Music in the Air. Mita is a desktop application where you can learn about music in interactive ways you never imagined. We're going to use it today for Act Two of the Amazing Ascension of Joseph Haydn. You can subscribe quickly and easily to Mita at our website, getmita.com. If you happen to miss Act One last week, don't worry. Act Two can be apprehended all on its own. We'll continue our exploration of Haydn's time in teeming London during the 1790s. We'll hear his stunning use of Turkish music in the military symphony, as well as two extraordinary movements from a late string quartet. All together, these help explain how this village offspring of a wheelwright and a cook rose to become the chairman of the board of European composers and the legitimate father of both the symphony and the string quartet. We last left our hero in these Hanover Square rooms, probably held about 800 people seating here. And for some concerts, we know that an additional 700 people stood, whether they stood here, whether the seating plan was the same in 1843 as it was in 1794, we can't know for sure. Haydn had an orchestra of about 40 players. This was far and away the biggest that he'd ever had the privilege of working with. So this little allegretto begins innocently enough. We know that Haydn based this movement on one that he'd written seven years earlier for the King of Naples, part of a concerto for lira organizzate, basically meaning a concerto for hurdy-gurdy and chamber organ, if you can imagine that. This was on request. So it begins like this. <laughs> so on. Now minor. to major. Sounds straightforward enough. But what does Haydn do with all this? This is a movement that he wrote while he was back in Vienna in 1793, anticipating, of course, that he would need six more symphonies if he was going to be part of two more musical seasons, those February through May musical seasons in London. Let's look briefly at the listening guide so you can get an idea of the shape and how it relates to the earlier work. Well, here's the A section, and it's exactly like in the earlier work, played piano, alternating between, in this case, strings and winds. There's no hurdy-gurdy. And then the attack by the dreaded Turks. And then it returns back to the major mode for the final A section, seemingly exactly as in the Naples version. So let's in fact go to the score so we can get an even clearer picture of how all this goes down. You see here the A sections and then a coda at the end, which we'll talk about when we get to it. It's very much like it's Naples model, except of course, there's no hurdy-gurdy or chamber organ. But we have a flute. and so on, and then the winds get a crack at it. It goes back and forth, the strings again, and the winds again, and it seems very idyllic and bucolic. And then what happens on this page? We now see parts for triangle, cymbals, and bass drum. These were the traditional instruments that the West had decided on had a Turkish sound, even of course, 
though the triangle had no real part in a Janissary band. But let's see how the audience was electrified here. Now there's softer parts in the relative major, and then back to and you notice the triangle plays and by the way, I've never seen a score where the triangle parts as shown here correspond in any way to what the triangle actually plays, but that's something else altogether. And again, finally, another forte outburst. And then we work our way back to the opening A section. So far, we've followed very closely, aside from the introduction of the Turkish instruments, the outline of the Naples Concerto. What could be more innocent? So if we had these various combinations, that is the soft melody with the major mode, and then the loud melody in the minor mode, one easily represents the innocent Austrians and the other, the marauding Turks. But now what happens? We go on here, piano for a while, and it looks as if it's gonna be just like the concerto, but something very unusual happens. My goodness, that. Well, you can hear that that's the tune and that's the Turkish instruments, but they're not in minor, they're in the major mode. What about the demonizing of the Turks? It's very clear that Haydn is proposing some kind of reconciliation, if you will. But after this outburst, ah, now we're going to get back to the pastoral, easygoing move here. Ah, thank goodness. And the audience will have gone crazy in a moment here. Now, this sense of reconciliation or rapprochement, we could say, certainly the members in the audience would have fully understood what Haydn was getting at. Okay, we're winding down. Perhaps it will end very much in the spirit of the concerto movement. But look out, as you can see, in the trumpet. Now, Haydn is not only going to introduce the apocalyptic trumpet, but a kind of harmony that he almost never uses. He reserves for very special occasions. <laughs> And now the timpani will begin furious drum rolls, and Haydn will go to a key we call six flat. It's always a key that's far away, distant, but it's usually one that's comforting and inviting, but not this one. <laughs> Thing. Okay, my blood pressure, my blood pressure is running a bit high here. Ah!
had the score, of course, we could anticipate a bit what was coming. But Haydn's audience had no idea, and it absolutely thrilled them to death, and they demanded and got an immediate encore. Minuets were supposed to be simple fare. It's a dance. It's supposed to lower the tension. It should be very straightforward. Haydn bases his minuet around a rhythm that all of us can remember because we hear it many times. As simple as that, ta -ta 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 -ta. if we go to the listening guide, we can get a quick picture of how this is laid out. The minuet is itself in binary form, although Haydn doesn't repeat the first half. The trio is a full binary form, first half and second half both repeat. And then we have a da capo of the entire opening minuet. So we have a combination of da capo form and binary form. Lots of repetition. Look at how many times we hear the minuet idea. And then again. So Haydn is very intent on making this much more interesting than a simple dance form. The score really shows us how he pulls this off. My goodness, look at this. A lot of activity going on, much more sophisticated than we would expect. So all of these fast notes then are part of what we call a rhythmic upbeat that gives the movement its forward motion. Here we go. I just want to point out this little bit of chromaticism here. That's really not something we would have expected in a simple major mode phrase. And then in the repetition of the idea, suddenly now we're at a village tavern. And notice that this rising line here is shadowed by the line in the oboes. The second half then takes this idea and makes it much more complex, these rising lines in the bass. And now Haydn returns us to the opening idea with a pedal. That means the same note. This derives from the organist sitting on the bench and holding down a low note with their foot. And so this same note then will persist throughout. Now the pedal point disappears for a moment and the bass line descends chromatically. And now he uses the notes from the minor mode to ramp up our sense of expectation. And if you remember, last time we just had this little bit of imitation here in this rising line. But now they're extended down into the bass as well, so that we have the violins and the double basses and cellos competing or imitating one another. And now, of course, in this cadence, this run up to the end of the section, Haydn will really have a five, seven to one. That is the most elemental cadence that he possibly could have. He'll repeat it three times for emphasis. And now, of course, he'll repeat the whole affair but we'll jump ahead to the end of it here and go right into the trio. Maybe we'll just do the final cadence here again. Mm -hmm. 
my goodness, this is really emphatic. What could follow? Well, the trio, and you might think, what is trio? Why do they say trio? Well, it's because this middle section traditionally in these Baroque dances was cut down in the number of voices, not necessarily to three exactly, but to smaller forces, which is what happens here. And it's all based on this lovely little dotted motion in the flutes and oboe. And the section repeats, but something then happens in the second half of the trio. Very bucolic. Ah! Where did that come from? Well, of course, it's a reminder of those Turks again, isn't it? Repeats the second half, and then of course we have the da capo of the minuet. So a very repetitive but balanced dance movement in third place. Before we listen to the finale, let's listen to what a couple of critics had to say about Haydn's style. Here's the youngish English composer William Crotch writing about Haydn, but later composers, and he means Haydn, to be grand and original, have poured in such floods of nonsense under the sublime idea of being inspired, that the present symphony bears the same relation to good music as the ravings of a bedlamite, i.e. an insane person, do to sober sense. Sometimes the key is perfectly lost by wandering so from it that there is no road to return. But the very respected music historian Charles Burney had a very different take. He, by the way, was a bud of Haydn's on both of his 18-month London sojourns. He argued that a listener to Haydn, quote, receives pleasure from various styles and effects, even when melody is not so vulgarly familiar as to be carried home from once hearing, or even when there is no predominant melody. If a compensation be made by harmony, contrivance, and the interesting combination of the whole. So we can see that Haydn's style aroused a great deal of controversy on both sides. And it was this combination of the serious and the comic, of earnestness and sensibility, as 18th century minds might have framed it. Let's see how he carries this off then to almost supercharged effect in the fourth movement. From its very first phrases, we know it's going to be a lot of cat and mouse. One of the things we'll see Haydn making the most of in this movement is playing with rests. Listen to how he puts us on the edge of our seats. There'll be a lot more of that. Let's just take a quick look at the listening guide. So it's a sonata movement. It's got an exposition. It has a development, has a recapitulation, and a coda. But all of this is going to happen within five minutes. The opening theme is a binary form, just like we had in the minuet and trio. It sounds a bit like a jig that would have concluded a Baroque dance suite. Repeats then. And then in the second half, it turns to the minor and it descends into a kind of silence. And then suddenly, and we'll use another pedal point to prepare the return. But this kind of juxtaposition is just what Haydn loves. And just as a preview for his so-called secondary area theme, which should be something that we can hum, that's 
memorable in some ways, Haydn has no melody at all. So that's the kind of playfulness that he brings to the movement. Let's go right to the score. You'll notice from the layout of the score that it has the triangle, the symbols and the bass drum already notated. That's interesting because we wouldn't really have expected them after that second movement, but we'll see. So it opens with just the strings. And repeats, of course. Now watch how this minor mode disappears down into nothing. Pianissimo. And the way in which Haydn uses the timpani there, the timpani can only play two notes, so Haydn takes full advantage when he can. <laughs> and now another pedal point. It's always on the fifth degree of the scale because that's gonna lead right back to the tonic. Okay, so we already know what kind of humor Haydn is putting on display in this movement. He repeats the second half again, and then we finally go into the transition to the new key. And again, do you hear the timpani pounding? Now you may remember from the first movement last week about the challenge of hearing modulations. Well, in this case, we may not know where we're going, but we know we're going somewhere. Look what Haydn does. Rest. He's just playing with us now. My goodness, what could happen after this? I think we're being set up for a prat fall. And notice all this area is brum, 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 brum. We don't need a tune. So the tune is basically just brump, 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 brump. See if you can hum it. And now Haydn will take us on one of those lovely digressions, one of those excursions off the road in our off road vehicle. Now we're in the development, but look just how abrupt it was from fortissimo to back to those piano rests. Development, rest. Now check the timpani out here. It's a great moment. Okay, so part of Haydn's pulling us around by the nose includes an immediate digression to the minor mode. Now what should I do? You don't normally have fermatas, that is pauses in the middle of music like this. Kind of wandering aimlessly, if you will, for the moment here. But then suddenly he takes just the head of the primary theme. And we're off on another little jaunt, this time in A flat major. A flat major is again about 
the relationship we humans have to a piece of grass in terms of the key relationship. Again, rests. And now we are momentarily in C sharp minor. You couldn't be further away from G major than C sharp minor. And of course, we know he'll find some hijinks way of getting back to G major. Now watch out. And notice the back and forth among the instrument, which is immediately imitated by the second violins. So there's all this back and forth all the way through. It's a combination this time of great learnedness and great wit unleashed simultaneously. What the retransition is, is simply getting us back to the beginning. So we left in the transition, we return in the retransition, but he has a lot of hot potato fun with it first. And then he throws in the pedal point that he had at the end of the theme, way back in the original. Here it is again. Rests. Ah. Okay, this is all quite a handful already, but remember those Turkish instruments that we were promised? We will get to the Turkish instruments after, again, another delicious digression that's both in terms of dynamics and pitches and key areas and themes and rests is just a feast. Romanticism. This is a key again called flat six. It's a remote key. It's one that Haydn loves to use for surprise. And now the bass line rises wonderfully by steps. And now what happens here? We see the triangle, the cymbals, and the bass drum let loose now in the secondary area. And it's absolutely perfect because there's no tune going on here anyway. Now, I guarantee you, at this point, 1,500 people in the Hanover Square rooms went nuts. Again, another excursion. But now he saved the ultimate tease for the very end of the movement. And this one really is a tongue twister. Or I should say, a stutter. So we've had some wonderful splashes of dramatic color with our Turkish colleagues, but now we're back to the original playfulness. But wait. It's fair to say it truly is now party time. Here's what a contemporary reviewer had to say about an unusual repeat performance only a week later of 
this symphony. Another new symphony by Haydn was performed for the second time. And the middle movement, that's of course the Turkish instruments movement, was again received with absolute shouts of applause. Encore, encore, encore resounded from every seat. The ladies themselves could not forbear. It is the advancing to battle and the march of men, the sounding of the charge, the thundering of the onset, the clash of arms, the groans of the wounded, and what may well be called the hellish roar of war, increased to a climax of horrid sublimity, which, if others can conceive, he alone can execute. At least he alone hitherto has effected these wonders. Not a bad review. Our own performance with Christopher Hogwood and the Academy of Ancient Music uses the same forces on period instruments, meaning instruments in use during the late 18th century, as those used at Haydn's premiere. You may have already noticed the clear, transparent sound that makes the wit and the drama so easy to capture. Chris was a pioneer of the early music revival, a brilliant, gentle, perpetually youthful man of great charm and Haydn-esque wit. I'll never forget his coming regularly to Los Angeles during the 1980s, where he would take a cab straight from the airport to rent a wreck. There he would pick up a slightly weathered Ford Mustang of a vintage before 1970 and tool jauntily around LA with the top always down. For someone who lived in foggy London, this was not just a reprieve, this was paradise. Christopher founded the Academy in 1973. He loved to regale me with stories of the Academy's early days. For example, once they booked a concert at a school some train ride north of London. And when they arrived, the students had already gone home for a holiday. So Chris and the band played for the cooks and the cleaning staff. Chris and the Academy were the first to record all of the Mozart symphonies, only one of their many distinguished achievements during Chris's leadership over more than three decades. The figure to whom Haydn was most consistently compared during his lifetime was another Englishman the writer Lawrence Stern. And if you think of Stern's most popular publication, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, Gentleman, published between 1759 and 1767, the parallels are really quite striking. Like Tristram, Haydn starts conventional stories, but then also like Tristram, he can't stay on topic. You may remember that Tristram takes until volume three of nine volumes to actually get born. But anyway, like Tristram, Haydn always returns to his original narrative in time to hold our attention. In short, both Haydn and Stern's Tristram are erudite pranksters. Finally, we can't leave this page without acknowledging the Scottish woman, Elizabeth Schroeter, who was an unexpected bright light in both of Haydn's London stays. Shortly after his arriving in 1791, he received a note from her requesting a music lesson. She had been widowed three years earlier after being married to a well-known German pianist and composer. Haydn and Rebecca's friendship deepened quickly and they carried on their affair for all three years of Haydn's stays in London. Among Haydn's papers are 22 letters copied out carefully in Haydn's hands of letters that Rebecca had written to him. Presumably she'd asked him to return them. That's just one example. In, in March of 1792, she wrote, my dearest, I cannot be happy till I see you. If you know, do tell me when you will come. And it's really quite extraordinary that London's tribe of gossip mongers did not pick up on their relationship at all, which speaks to the great discretion practiced by both. Like Luigi Polzelli and Esterhazy, Haydn commented to friends that ah, he would have married Rebecca had he himself not still been legally married. One can't help but wonder a little if Haydn found his married status a convenient way of avoiding a permanent entanglement. But we can probably be pretty sure, as I write in Mita, that in an era when longevity was always uncertain, that if they did not latch on to the wisps of sweetness crossing their paths, 
they would not have a chance at even partial happiness. We're going to jump now to the other main genre that Haydn rightfully could claim as he being the inventor of, and that is the string quartet. In Vienna at the time, they distinguished between really two kinds of music. There was public music, and that could be like the symphony we just heard, or opera, or big concerts, big public concerts that were rare, but they happened. And then private music, which the string quartet was at the head of the line in, but private music meant it was not designed for public performance. The audience were the four players themselves. And since the Viennese style was inherently a conversational style, and we heard a lot of conversation already in the symphony, it can really be taken to extraordinary lengths when we have four participants in an intimate back and forth conversation. And you'll notice the seating plan here. This is the modern plan where you have the pinnacle string quartet sitting with the two violins, the viola, and the cello. Now, why these instruments? Why not a double bass? Well, the double bass is not quite as nimble as the cello. And if you take these instruments, the cello is pitched an octave lower than the viola. The viola is pitched a perfect fifth lower than the violins. And the way the overtone series works with these four instruments is that these two together share the upper overtones are partials, and they all reinforce each other. There's also the fact that the most complicated chord in the Viennese vocabulary had four notes. By the time he completed his London symphonies, Haydn had composed 104 of them. He only wrote 83 string quartets, but they are an extraordinary group, again, in the way that they grow in subtlety and complexity and richness and nuance throughout Haydn's life. This set here from Opus 76 was composed actually after he returned to Vienna from London. So they're very late and they have all the best that Haydn has to offer. The string quartet was just like the symphony in four movements, usually a fast movement, a slow movement, a menuet, and a finale. So are we going to get a pale reflection of the symphony? Not. Okay. The first movement, which we'll just dwell on briefly, has instead of being in a fast and dynamic sonata form shape, is a ternary form with a lilting theme. <laughs> So it purposely does not carry a whole lot of dramatic weight. That's because the dramatic weight of the quartet will be borne by the slow movement, the largo cantabile. That's pretty standard, slow and singingly, but a mesto. The 18th century had a very different notion than we do today of what mesto actually means. So sad is this in the 18th century. So it's sad in the sense of wistfulness or perhaps a bit of nostalgia. Now, look at this key signature. One, two, three, four, five, six sharps. You can't have more than that. Why not take these all away and put in one flat and just play an F major like a beginning piano student could? Well, on the piano, playing on the white and the black keys is you know, a little bit different, but not drastically so. But on a string instrument, playing in all sharps makes you be totally on your toes so that you bring an extra intensity to the movement. And the players would have recognized that immediately when they got into it. So let's jump right to the score. Remember, the first movement was just a, a lighter ternary form. So this is where the heavy duty protein is. Let's look at how he puts this together. Well, it looks like the first violin has all the fun in the beginning, doesn't it? It's a kind of hymn-like texture with the three voices providing a slow, steady underpinning. And by the way, this word tenuto means to hold. So to really 
not rush anything. Get your full mileage out of every note. Now you'll notice there was another feature there that is making a crescendo from soft to loud and then back down to soft again. That kind of arc is something we expect in romantic music, but not so much here at all. So then we have a transition. Again, the three lower voices play smoothly along while the violin has the melody. And now we make our modulation. You can feel the music moving, even if you don't know exactly where it's going. Now, so far it's been beautiful, but not extraordinary, but what happens here is extraordinary. For his secondary idea, and I don't know of a single other example in the Viennese literature where this happens, the transition right here, yum, badim, badam, which we had just a moment ago, and the main theme itself, da di dam, bim, bam, bada, they join hands to create the secondary area. What an extraordinary effect. And now all four instruments take part in the conversation equally. And now we switch off. And then a very strange closing area because it is not emphatic, it's not terribly cadential, it takes its time. And now we're going to hear what's called a deceptive cadence. This is going to be a dominant seventh chord, that is, that would prepare us for a return to our new temporary tonic in the new key, but it's going to go instead to the sixth degree up a step. You'll hear it. Ah. Then. and the gentlest of cadences. We take initially the major mode that Haydn modulated to. But suddenly it's going to go dark. So you can see this movement is filled with intimate drama. It is far and away the longest movement in the quartet. And we end this C sharp minor section on a fermata, a very expectant, long held note. And then Haydn surprises us. Suddenly,
in a completely unrelated key, the wrong key as it were, and way too high. So the retransition continues playing out all this intimate drama. The viola singing. Wonderful dark sound of the viola. And the cello now answers. And it all climaxes on a very fancy chord known as an augmented sixth chord. You don't need to know a thing about it except to feel the wonderful sense of push and pull that it brings. another fermata will then finally have a recapitulation. The way in which it closes, it's a very brief coda, but it has an incredibly tender, poignant kind of feel. I think you'll agree. It's sadness. I can no longer speak. Can you imagine the delight of the players when they came upon this movement for the first time? And by the way, they were expected to sight read this stuff. We'll just spend a moment on the minuet third movement. What I want to point out is the way in which it plays with a feature known as hemiola. So if you're in one, two, three, one, two, three, you have three plus three. But what if you organize that six beat pattern as two plus two plus two? So you get one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two. So listen, I'll just show it with my hands. I think you can see the way in which he takes this minuet, it's supposed to be a dance, and this would totally trip up any players in this stylized version of a minuet. The last movement of this quartet is one of the most extraordinary that Haydn ever wrote. It matches the hijinks of the London Symphony that we heard, but because it's just solo instruments, they're a bit more nimble, and the cat and mouse aspect is heightened even further. We spoke earlier in relationship to the second movement of a hurdy-gurdy. So here this crank is turned slowly around against two strings so that it produces this drone that continues. And then within a very limited range, usually of about a fifth, just the five fingers on your hand on the keyboard, the melody could be played to accompany it. And then of course, this gentleman here is singing at the same time in this wonderful 17th century painting. So let's see what Haydn does to imitate a hurdy-gurdy. For one thing, a hurdy-gurdy would not be very interesting if you just played a long drone. So he breaks it into staccato, bum, 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 and that's the way the hurdy-gurdy is brought to life and, and given a lot more horsepower than it would normally have. And I especially want you to pay attention to this opening because we're gonna hear it again in a very surprising place. So he just begins with a five, seven to one series of cadences that go, closer and faster together each time. Okay. Okay. And now. All right. And here comes the hurdy-gurdy. And the tune in the violin is only going to be a five-finger tune, just like we could play on the piano. And it's meant to be anything but profound. 
Now the cellist jumps in. I mean, let me go back to those opening chords. Da -dun, da -dun. Listen. So Haydn has used them to make a kind of weak modulation, if you will. We're not really in our new key yet, but we're kind of set up for it. And then that rhythm again. And here's one of the funniest parts in the whole quartet, one that Haydn repeats in both the exposition and the return, the recapitulation. We start out with perfect fifths, and then they turn into a tritone, which is a half step smaller and sounds really weird, but utterly delightful in this context. And then pure cat and mouse here. And he cadences essentially briefly in the minor mode of all things. But now finally, the closing area, which is simply based on this giddy up rhythm. Sing along. And you may have gotten the impression by now that composers were actually freest to do their most radical compositional experiments in chamber music because of the freedom that these four independent voices afforded them. And the figuration that we're now going to hear in the first violin, you simply couldn't have it in an orchestra. It would be too unwieldy to make come off together. Remember the rests of the finale to the symphony? It's now in the form here of what's called a GP or grand pause or big pause. And then, and we cadence. But this cadence will take a very strange turn as you'll hear, going from a very sweet little ending to boom, in a totally unexpected key. Again, what we call today flat six. You'll hear the surprise. And now a pie in the face. Now he does such a, a wonderful, fun thing here. He takes the primary theme that we've heard a dozen times and he simply sequences it, moves it in a series of stages up one note at a time. So here we are in B flat. <laughs> And now we're going to move up a step to C minor. And now up a step to D minor. And now back and forth, hot potato. And here, of course, is play catch, ball, back and forth. Here we go. And now this retransition is extraordinary because it's the drone again. But then he puts another perfect fifth on top. Now this recapitulation is extraordinary for a lot of reasons. First of all, Haydn leaves out the first 16 bars. He jumps right into what is really the transition. And notice now who has the fastest, most difficult part to play the second violinist. So Haydn knew that he had to please everyone in the group. And so Haydn compresses all of this over the exposition. Here's that passage we heard in the exposition, which is so much fun going from the perfect fifth up here to the tritone. And now our 
closing idea. This is the idea that was in the other key. We can check that out very quickly here. Here it was in the other key. And here it is now in the recapitulation. If you're a newcomer to Mita, you may notice I'm no virtuoso on the computer keyboard, believe me. But it is so easy to stop and start with pinprick precision so that you can show yourself or demonstrate to a friend or to a class and know exactly where you're going to start. And now the grand pause, the long rest. And we're going to come back to this cadence. And something is going to happen that will remind us of where we started. And do you remember this? How did the movement begin? It began like this, remember? And then it concludes like this. It's like the cat chased its tail and finally caught it. Even if you're already a Meta subscriber, you may not be aware of some other stashes of knowledge within Meta. Just click on Haydn's name, and it brings up not just his biography, but his legacy. And you get a complete rundown of all the music that Haydn wrote, and it's an opportunity for us to also share with you some direct quotations of Haydn about his own life. There are three very interesting ones here. First, Haydn on rules. He was often criticized for breaking rules. If I found something to be beautiful so that the ear and the heart, in my opinion, could be satisfied, and I would then have had to sacrifice such beauty to withered pedantry, then I would rather let stand a little grammatical slip. You can see how ironic that remark is, but it really is how he felt. And finally, two statements from Haydn about his own music. He wasn't a man of many words in that regard, so these are rather special. One very brief. I also believe I have done my duty and have been of use to the world through my works. That's kind of an 18th century outlook. But in another letter to a music society, he opened up somewhat and he said, there are so few happy and contented people here below. Grief and sorrow are always their lot. Perhaps my labors will once be a source from which the careworn or the man burdened with affairs, that means business affairs, can derive a few moments rest and refreshment. It's clear then that Haydn wasn't simply out to entertain his audiences. He was out to move them and to get into their hearts and minds. Okay, that's a wrap for this week. I really hope that you enjoyed our little highlights tour of Act Two of the Amazing Ascension of Joseph Haydn. If you're not yet a Mita subscriber, by the way, the seven works that we served up as hors d'oeuvres today can be main courses for you for the rest of your life with a Mita subscription. We'll come up with another interesting angle for next week, and I hope you'll be able to join us. Tell your friends and family, by the way, that we still have a few empty chairs. So long.